happy to have you. Um, I'm going to start off the conversation and then we'll take some questions from the audience. But Errol, I wanted to start with you. I know that Elsa's taken photographs of your family before and you've known each other for a very long time and have a friendship, but at what point did you know you were going to make this film? Really not until I started making it. <laughs> I never know. Although I have wanted to make it for years. I spent one afternoon with Elsa in her garage where all of the flat files are kept. And Elsa started opening drawers and pulling out Polaroids and then telling me stories about the photographs in those drawers. And I thought, at that time, I thought, this is a movie. <laughs> I don't know how. Really? Yeah, I didn't see a movie. <laughs> Was there Did you any... see a movie? Or... <laughs> well, we just saw a movie, so <laughs> definitely. So was there a lot of convincing that had to happen? What, how, what was your reaction, Elsa, when Errol came up to you and said, I would like to... I said, yeah, yeah, Errol. The way I say, yeah, yeah, yeah to Errol all the time. <laughs> and then and I thought, oh, you know, that's Monday's idea. Tuesday would be a new idea. Good, Errol, good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so really, it was like that. I said, I'm going to make a movie. I said, okay. Are you interested? I said, sure. <laughs> and then I thought, I had a lot to do. And I, and then like the next Saturday, he said, we're going to start on Monday. I said, uh, what? <laughs> well, well, there was a, a reason to start shooting because they were moving those gigantic Polaroids right. out of the stairwell uh, of your home. Right. And I thought, I should record it. Right. I don't even know why. It seemed like one of these events, these right. important events that should be recorded. Right. And so we started. Right, and it was an event because they're 40 by 80, and we lived in a house from 1870 that was very narrow, and we had to have like climb, uh, climbers, to guide it down. It was a real movie. Was, <laughs> they finally ended up taking it down and across the third floor. That's Javi at his desk. And we luckily had a, an outside porch like Victorian triple deckers have. And then it started to snow. <laughs> just sprinkled, just sprinkled lightly. Didn't hit, didn't hit the snow. And Elsa, what was the experience like for you? I mean, you put yourself in the camera, but having somebody else treating you as a subject for a sustained amount of time culminating in this, what was that experience like? I would say it was like psychoanalysis, although I've never gone to plenty of shrinks, but never psychoanalysis, but it's what I would think. It was very, I decided at the beginning that if I was gonna do it for Errol, I was not going to hold any, I was going to do it. I wasn't going to invent this life that I never had. Like I was a size eight. Oh, in the days I was a size eight. I was never a size eight. So, you know, I was going to face the facts. And so, and, and so, and so but that was my, my answer. That was my, and then I just was like, in his hands, and I never saw it till it was done. Like I never, he never said, "Oh, good track, girl." Or, 
you didn't want to see it. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I probably did say I didn't want to see it. That would be like me because I I I, I would have decided, put in my Elsa. It would have been more. It wouldn't be the thing. Right. Well, that's the I'm moving you know. <laughs> you didn't get the point of that lettuce. That was something. <laughs> And Errol, what was the process like for you? I mean, there's no Interatron. You're filming a very close friend. It's you know, it's it's different than several of your recent films. It's very intimate. It's it's really like a, a friendship love letter almost. Um, Why that? almost? Well, it is. I don't have the words in your mouth. But what was that experience like shooting something this intimate and warm and kind of personal? Well, guess what? I love Elsa. <laughs> It comes and across. I, I loved Elsa before making the movie, during the making of the movie, and I still love Elsa. So that much hasn't really changed. That's amazing, huh? <laughs> and I'm really glad that I made the movie. I really am glad that I recorded something which I think is important and valuable. Um, and also, to quote Elsa herself, ridiculous. <laughs> uh, I've often thought that there's a very close connection between the profound and the ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And she proves that principle. Or at least my mother does. <laughs> or at least your mother does. Mm -hmm. Elsa, you're ridiculous. <laughs> Take some questions from the audience. Right there in the middle. And I'll repeat the questions over in here. So. You've said this is most like fast, cheap, and out of control. How do you see those connections, Errol? Uh, Errol said this is most like fast, cheap, and out of control. How does he see those connections? I don't know if I see connections at all. Is this like any other film I've made? Maybe, maybe not. It's a film about an artist, uh, an artist who I respect, an artist who I see as a kindred spirit. Um, I've often been fascinated by Elsa's photography because it involves a collaboration between your subjects and yourself. People come into your studio and they present themselves to the camera and you take their pictures. There's something incredibly simple about that idea and also something incredibly complex. And dangerous for me and for them. Have you ever been physically assaulted by a subject? No, but they must attack me when they get in the car. Oh. <laughs> like, what was she doing? What was she thinking? Yeah. I don't think she liked me. I look like a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But I, I agree. And also, we, we would dig into Elsa's house and office and there was really just a treasure trove of material that emerged these old films old photographs and I don't know whether they would have been preserved or not but at least they're preserved in this movie and some of the stuff is really pretty remarkable I hear her phrases, that would be you, um, nailing down the now. Um, like her close friend, uh, Allen Ginsberg, Elsa is a poet. Although she doesn't know it. <laughs> but notwithstanding, 
a poet nonetheless. <laughs> I think it's very brave of me. <laughs> you know? and, and it's like the longest um, 90 seconds. It used to be 90 seconds. But pretty much I know how things are going. The thing you don't know is um, like a blink, or, or especially with like a kid nine, so you don't know if at the last minute they'll do something. Or, or a cat, you know. So, so that's why I think so many of them are gifts, the pictures are gifts, because it's, it's chance, it's, it's a miracle. I, I, I think there's a big miracle factor in these. And in fact, photography, because it kneels down a millisecond, it's a lot of, it's a lot of miracle in a way, because it's, that little sliver of time preserved on this piece of paper, but it could easily be the second before and the second after. And like today I was reading obituary in the Times about a war photographer who just died, and he was an incredible war photographer. And he like followed the bullets, and he, I mean, he was really rare. It was a, it's a great article. Now I can't remember the guy's name. That's what happens when you're 80. But anyone? Yes. Well, buy his books. <laughs> he sounded great. I'm going to buy them. Elsa, do you think the format made it more special? Because right now we're in this digital culture where you know, there's no cost to taking photos. And so people will take hundreds, if not, you know, thousands of photos, but all of it's very disposable. So do you, I, I, I mean, watching this, I feel it's that preciousness almost of the format and that you have this one shot and right. it really resonates. Right, it's strong. Actually, it, it was a miracle that the 20 by 24 came out when it did. The, and there was no cam, no, you know, well, just you take these, in, what you're saying, take these instant pictures, 30 of them, 40 of them, legs crossed, uncrossed, left, right, over, left, come on, come on, come on, come on. It, then maybe the 20 by 24, if they came out simultaneously on the market, maybe the 20 by 24 would have been a yawn. But it was really lucky that it came out and had this window for the people like me and now, um, you know, everybody is dealing with the cool ones that you have to see on your phone. Mm -hmm. And people don't even make prints. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. Right here. You mentioned, uh, well, you, you mentioned that Polaroid hadn't um, given you any free film and they hadn't given you a camera so you can bump that. The question is, why does she think Polaroid didn't value her more as a renowned photographer? They didn't like me. <laughs> what? I don't know. I never could figure it out. <laughs> Anyone from Polaroid here tonight? No. Right here in the middle? Yeah, uh, Elsa, I'm wondering if you have any uh, film, Polaroid film left. And if you if you do, what your plans are for using it, and if you don't, what would you like to use it for? Does she have any Polaroid film left? If she does, what are her plans for using it? And if she doesn't, what would she use it for? If she got it. Well, it just so happens in the audience, is the person in charge of the leftover film. <laughs> Raise your hand so we can identify you. Okay, there we go. All right. Where is he? I can't find him. Uh, With relatives. <laughs> I have no comment. <laughs> Anyhow, the, we, as it says in the movie, 
Ian Stern put up the money and we were able to buy the leftover film. So then it deteriorated, it's still deteriorating slowly and it's hard to use. And believe it or not, just like we're talking about marketing and the little, is there a word for can't, images that you had, you can't hold in your hand? Digital. 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 Um, uh, there isn't, you'd be surprised, you, uh, people don't claim to spend a lot of money on 20 by 24s. That's just the way it goes. And Elsa, following up on that lady's question, you didn't get the recognition, I feel, this whole audience feels so strongly you deserve during all those years. What's the experience been like now? I mean, this film had its world premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival last September. It's shown at the New York Film Festival. It's been all over. Neon is releasing it next month. So what has this last few months, whirlwind of audiences, been like for you? Well, I've heard from a lot of people from elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> And more people will go see Errol's movie and say, oh, it's not going to be scary. <laughs> it's not going to be gloomy. I saw a movie about it. <laughs> the music will be great. Isn't the music great? The music is great. Yeah. And I think of it as Elsa's movie. What? I think of it as your movie. <laughs> well, I didn't know. Well, it. it well, well, how could it have been my movie if I didn't push you around? <laughs> but I don't know the answer. They'll have to decide. I wanted to ask a philosophical question. You raised earlier, and I know you've written about this, Errol, photographs as truth. And you were saying earlier, there is no truth. I just want to see the surface of how people project themselves. What, do you think Errol has shown you a truth through his image and his film that you might not have seen otherwise? Say no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think no. I, 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 I don't know. I haven't digested it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I haven't quite, I haven't memorized it yet. Like I still am surprised. There's still. I've only seen it about five or six times, and and look, that's. I, that's not a lot if you're not a student looking on one of those, um, what were those machines called and where you look and look? Scheme decks, movieolas. Yeah, movieolas. See, I grew up in movieola days. You know, so you could like frame by frame study it. So I can't do that with this yet. He can, so he can do it. But so, so I, I, I don't know. I'm sure it's going to have a huge effect. But I have no idea what. They better act fast. <laughs> I think people who see the film realize how adorable you are. <laughs> Thank you. But I look at it and I say, hmm, different eyeglasses. What happened to those eyeglasses? <laughs> <laughs> I like my hair combed that way better than the other way. <laughs> and, oh, I was so thin back then. <laughs> right here in the middle. Speaking of scheme decks, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the editing process for this film, and also Elsa, if there was any moment that you remember that didn't make it. So can Errol talk about the editing process, and can Elsa speak to any moment that she remembers that didn't make the cut? We used a lot of it because yeah. we did it very, very quickly. It wasn't clear how long the film would be. So we kept adding the material that we would sh shot and it got a little bit longer and a little bit longer until, what do you know? It was a movie. It was a movie. It was gonna be a mini doc. So it was never, it was never planned out quite clearly. There was the day at Elsa's house, the moving of all of the 
a huge Polaroids out of the house to the photography studio. There was another day at the photography studio um, unwrapping the various gigantic Polaroids, the Polaroids of, of Ginsburg. Um, there was a day at Elsa's studio. Right, that was the last day, I think. I think the entire movie was done in four or five days. Um, it was done very, very, very quickly. And amazingly enough, there was enough material to turn it into a feature-length film. It still surprises me. It's a tribute, once again, to Elsa. Time for a few more questions, right there in the very back. Uh, is there a date for release yet, or is that still in the Is there a date for release? I bet there's some neon people in this audience who could. June 30th. There you go, June 30th. <laughs> Great, next question, right here in the front. Um, it, it reminds a little bit of, of your old first person series, just because it's all told from Elsa's point of view. It's entirely interviews with Elsa and then other footage. Was there ever any consideration once you had all the footage of Elsa um, of maybe talking to some other people and getting a sort of a, a context around it or was it all once you had the interviews with Elsa just we're going to go with Elsa? Never wanted to interview anybody else. Why would you want to do something like that? <laughs> Um, is anything happening with Elsa's archive now that the movie's out? Has, has there been any interest in buying or preserving her archive? No. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Everything is glacial in, in my life. <laughs> I mean, some people have speedy lives, but my life has been really glacial. <laughs> not, not that it's been a cold one, but it's, <laughs> I mean, in the movement. <laughs> we took the film to the Telluride Film Festival last year and Elsa brought her Polaroid camera. Um, and John and Nafis who were here. John and Nafis who were here. <laughs> um, Elsa took probably 70 or 80 photographs over two or three days. Um, complaining constantly about Telluride that there were too many trees. I told you it's the West. I think it was the combination of mountains and trees. He said it was like Nantucket with mountains. Too many trees in Nantucket. The mountains made it even worse. And it was that airport, that Denver airport. I, I come from Boston and I had and I've never really left Boston in, in a sort of very current way, the way the young people now always are going places. And so I had never seen anything as big as that airport. And I had like anxiety attacks. At, plus I couldn't walk that far. I never saw it. It went on and on and on. I, I, I was terrified. And, <laughs> If I had a private plane, I think I would travel. <laughs> I never know for sure whether I've done something really good in a film, but there are moments in this film that I really like. Um, and it's the moments of Elsa looking at her own photographs, um, the photographs of her parents, uh, the photographs of uh, Allen Ginsberg. Um, there's something very powerful about seeing the photographer, seeing Elsa, looking at photographs of people who have died. Um, something very deeply moving and mysterious. And if I preserve those moments, like a photograph, if you like, on film, I feel I've done something interesting, and I thank Elsa for that. Thank you, thank you, I thank you. I think that photographers must be obsessed with death, <laughs> because whether you admit it or not, because otherwise, what, 
why would you want to get into this business of saving time? Quixotic business of saving time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's different when you have to have a, pro a, a plot and everything. That's different than plotless. You don't have a plot, and you're taking pictures. You're just taking them. That must have to do with sort of the same thing as saving in your shopping baskets, labels, or, you know, stuff. But it's that... It has to do with that saving gene, that sort of, I mean, my husband has, and I know a lot of men who have clothes from when they were in junior high. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? <laughs> but I also find it very moving that as we try to save things, there's still, I think you call them the fugitives like the fugitive colors. So as much as, as hard as we try, things still escape, they exactly. still get away. Exactly, yeah. I think fugitive makes polar at Chimba. But, and I, it's the perfect word for it. A few more questions from the audience right here. It's very hard to get to those people, and they have control over their image. Right. And just like with Bob Dylan, who I who I only could take a picture because of Alan, but the he had a contract. I forget what the photographer's name was. He was a really good photographer. But anyhow, he made a stink, and Bob had to tell me that I had to leave because this guy had a contract. So once you are interested in like athletes, or I mean, think of the gorgeous pictures you get for some of these athletes. They, they, they're all controlled. They're a the pictures are a commodity. So uh, just, um, you'd have to have a staff person that only lined up, you know, the people to photograph that you could set. Yeah, you know, the, it, all the intellectual Well, by hanging around bookstores, but now there aren't even any bookstores to hang around. <laughs> what do people do without? I don't know. Well, was there ever someone where you felt like they wanted to have your you take their picture and it just didn't happen, or somebody who escaped you, or where? Any? No, I, I, no, because I'm, I'm not exact. I'm not a social butterfly, mm -hmm. and. Um, The answer is no, and it isn't always those people that are the most interesting. Oh, of course. It could have been the grocery store thing. Yeah. I, didn't, I just meant in general. Yeah, but no, so in general, there's no, I, I haven't hit that vein of fascination yet, either in me or me and them. And Although you have taken pictures of celebrities. Yeah, but not in the, in the, <laughs> big way of a celebrity photographer who sells their work to uh, Vanity Fair, say, or, I, I don't know. I don't know. That makes us all the more special, including your choice of subject matter. Yeah, I sort of do this at the end of my hour. <laughs> also, to a certain extent, correct me if I'm wrong, your subjects chose you, at least in part. Right. Actually, that's a really good point. The family pictures, of course, are all people who picked me. Yeah. We sought Elsa out. Um, you know, our son Hamilton was four years old, 
and my wife Julia wanted Elsa to take his picture. So funny, as a red background. <laughs> yeah, but I owe this friendship to my wife. Right, as everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Get it in while I can. <laughs> Indeed. Right here in the middle. Elsa, did you face a, a sexism in your career? Or do you feel like the, with the Polaroid that the fact that you are a woman held you back? Would yeah. advancing in that, that material way? She's asking if Elsa experienced sexism and if she feels that could have been something that held her back within that Polaroid world. Elsa's thinking. <laughs> um, well, the men did better than the women. So you could say you were writing, a, they have in books about, you know, women in photography in the 60s or the 70s, or, you know, that's back history now, but say my generation but numerically I'm really not sure I think psychologically it was a time that women didn't feel the the sky was theirs or the you know whatever the saying would be so I think it was impossible I graduated college in 1959 it was impossible for example it was impossible not to make the coffee every day at Grove Press. Hmm. Now that Grove Press was full of very enlightened people, but it was the girls, I'm calling them girls, who made the coffee and ran the Apico machine and thought nothing of it. It was really more like 69 before women began to think, I'm not gonna put up with this. And you know, and it, it's, still going on, so I, and it's so entwined with um, the, the her, her horizon you give yourself and everything. I, I, I think, it, I don't know a, a, a glib answer, right? It, I don't have a really glib, facile answer. It has to be the way girls, um, think of themselves and think of what their possibilities are. Their mothers are probably still saying, or somebody saying, oh, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What do you do? <laughs> I'm an editor, a film editor. Well, there you go. <laughs> Is it easier now for women in film editing? Of course you would have. You have to wonder? <laughs> See, now I never, I just take it for granted. But you, had, well, I think it's probably good that you wonder. But anyhow, I would, don't wonder another day. <laughs> I mean, well, you, not that you can do anything about it, but you just don't blame yourself. I think when I was at, at um, ESI, when I picked up a camera, I was interested in film because it was the same people making, I forget what they would call it, like educational film strips. And we came to New York and we were gonna meet with several editors and I think we met two women and they were like movie stars to the men that I was with because they were such rare people. I used to remember their names, but it was really a special thing. So, well, that's 50 years ago, but you know. Time for one last 50 time. years ago, I was 30. <laughs> so think of that. See what I mean. The mother thing that amazes me about the Mars is um, its absence of pretension. Um, uh, I had to write up an application, a recommendation uh, to the Guggenheim for Elsa, and she didn't get it. Um, and I 
described her work as the perfect combination of Renaissance portraiture and dime store photography. Um, that element of the quotidian lifted in some way. Um, always liked your art, still do. Always saw Elsa as an artist. So it's nice to have had the opportunity to make this. Time for one last question. Over here, sir. The coffee table book. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I want to do the coffee table book. Thank you. We have to do it. That'll happen. Well, for those of you that want to keep talking about the film, there's a lot to talk about. We're going to go to Opa. It's on West 4th Street. You literally turn left from the theater, you turn left again, and it's on the south side of the street. I hope you return for more Stranger Than Fiction, and please help me thank Errol Morris and Elsa Burke.